not always possible to uh, spend time in the company of uh, people we like in the flesh. Sometimes we need to do it virtually. And uh, today um, is just such an occasion. It's uh, my uh, great pleasure to talk to an old friend of mine, Alexandra Pregalinska. It's my pleasure too. Who is uh, a leading expert on uh, really the way we interact with technology as, as human beings. Or should we say perhaps uh, the way that technology interacts with us. It goes both ways, I think. Doesn't it just? Seemingly, the easiest questions are uh, often, if not usually, the hardest. And uh, I've spoken to a number of AI researchers and, and engineers, and somehow the definition of mm. what is artificial intelligence attempts to be eluding them. Yeah, well, that's the hardest question that you could ask, really. Uh, because, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll try to handle it somehow. Uh, at least a few responses, I think, uh, are good. Artificial intelligence. Uh, there are many responses possible, you know. Uh, um, what is artificial intelligence? I guess, you know, first of all, it's uh, a research project, uh, an ongoing research project that uh, started in the 40s and 50s of the previous century and uh, was always about creating machines, technologies, uh, programs that could simulate human intelligence, uh, that could simulate human perception, uh, the use of natural language, and that could process information in a way that human processes information or human brain processes the information. And there, obviously these are always approximations because these systems are based on silicone, they work slightly different, but then again, um, we have managed um, as an AI community to create systems that do speak, uh, interact with humans that do process information that can also be um, visually uh, perceptive so they can see objects and detect them and that can uh, synthesize speech and understand what you say when you use your voice. So um, that's just, uh, I guess, one of the definitions, a research project that is uh, still uh, not over. Actually, I would say it's uh, in an ascent phase because uh, we have not created a, a really intelligent artificial being yet. Uh, that was the promise at the beginning. And then, you know, uh, that promise was uh, somehow, I think, uh, well, never fulfilled. Uh, even though in the 60s and 70s, some of the researchers said, well, it's going to take just five more years and we'll have the true AI. We've been, we've been five years away from reaching true general AI for yeah. about 50 years. Yes, yeah, well, exactly. So that's why we had all these day AI winters, right, which were the periods uh, where the funding was uh, lacking because everybody wasn't happy with the results of uh, AI research. On the other hand, I would say artificial intelligence are, are all the endeavors or efforts of engineers uh, to apply you know, the, the, the research into real life and create systems that actually do some things, right? So I would say uh, a machine vision system is an artificial intelligence. Uh, these days, anything can be connected to anything, really. Yes, that's very true. We have a, a thriving Internet of Things these days, uh, and all the connected objects send data and uh, receive data and process data. And obviously, uh, with the growth of the Internet of Things, I think we uh, should expect uh, more context-aware systems too. So, uh, you know, data is kind of not enough, and I'm quite sure that my field, which is artificial intelligence, will help, help kind of in... Um, making these connected objects most also more context-aware uh, objects that will be able to interpret data in the proper manner. Um, I see uh, artificial intelligence uh, as a, a potentially huge tool in uh, uh, helping building systems, let's call them, um, become more, well, to use a, 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 a cliche term, friendly to, to us as humans. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very true. So uh, my team and myself, we work on human-machine interaction and actually making technology more friendly is our biggest goal here. So we did lots of uh, experiments with various sensors to see how people feel interacting with technologies. And I think the same methodologies could be applied to thinking how people could feel in particular 
buildings or, or, or spaces. So uh, I'm quite sure that, you know, again, with the growth of the Internet of Things and also with uh, further developments in machine learning, we will be able to understand how people feel and interact with spaces, with buildings also better and also make uh, possibly these spaces more responsive to their needs and to their uh, current state of mind, let's say, right? So there are many, for instance, now attempts to create lightning systems that could be more attached to how people feel in a particular moment. And I think this is a very interesting sort of uh, sphere where um, kind of emotions and uh, interactions and um, human kind of mental states uh, are becoming uh, this context that you were mentioning before for technologies to kind of become more responsive. Preparing for this, for this uh, gathering here today, we were discussing, among other things, the, the, uh, again, that word context, of um, discrete buildings, discrete projects, interacting uh, with the world outside uh, in a physical sense and in a, in, in a virtual sense. And uh, one of the, uh, the examples that, that came up was a, a hotel, which is inherently a complex organism um, with many moving parts. Um, these moving parts depend on, on the time of year, depend on, on uh, the time of the week, whether it's a weekend or, or, or a weekday. People come, people go, they have their individual needs. The marketing system further out there needs to be um, somehow plugged into the, uh, the, uh, the system that manages the building. I see artificial in intelligence um, really working some serious magic in, 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 in this aspect. Oh, definitely. Uh, I don't know. Have you watched Altered Carbon? That's this. Recent... I tried to, you know, I tried to, and it was just, just too hard. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a dystopia. That's yeah. very true. But you know, I think it's um, a very interesting example. Also, there, um, there's one character that is a very interesting example of a, of a smart building and AI at the same time. So that's not a spoiler, really, because it's the first episode. Uh, but there is a hotel who is also a person, right? So it's like a, there is a. A smart hotel that is a building that adjusts perfectly to human needs. And at the same time, there is this concierge that is the central operating system. And he's also like interacting with humans and, and he's very responsive to kind of their emotional states and who, their problems. Who designs the co concierge? Does, the that, concierge that, kind of codes itself, exactly but that's a right. further future, you, you know? know? So that, that's like uh, the probably the, you know, as far as we can go, uh, thinking about artificial intelligence today is a super autonomous system that is able to code itself, right? And optimize itself the, without human intervention. There are only so many scenarios that, that you and I could come up with yeah, to design yeah. this thing. I mean, oh, definitely. Th there comes a time where it needs to start to design itself. Well, I think so, especially with such a robust system, you have to have a system that is at least semi-autonomous and semi-unsupervised, you know, by, by humans. So I think this is a fantastic example of a of a smart hotel that is at the same time a sort of an, an interface of interaction with humans, a physical space that is adapting to humans' needs. And also, um, I would say, uh, just a building, you know, just a beautiful building that is very nicely retro designed. Actually, it looks like 19th or 18th century hotel. So it's like, a, for me, it was like the best hotel I have seen so far, I think. Have you, can you think of any... Um success stories, uh, examples of, of uh, where, um, I don't know, a moment of epiphany mm -hmm. came, came upon a, a, a yeah. tough as nails engineer who realized, actually, I need to be thinking about, about this somewhat differently in order mm -hmm. to design, design yeah. things that, that, that make sense in the future. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's 2018 and last year was very important for AI. So 2017 was that wow year for our, our whole community, I think. And, uh, well, first of all, Sophia the robot gained citizenship of Saudi Arabia, which as you is, may know, which is, which is a PR, relations. which is public <laughs> relations, but it is interesting and important on the level of, you know, how AI will but socialize. It is a milestone, right? Yeah, it is a milestone somehow, even though it is a PR move at the same time, but that's obviously not the most important thing that has happened in 2017, because I think the most important one was obviously AlphaGo Zero. Mm -hmm. AlphaGo Zero, a system that defeated humans, all humans basically, in the traditional Chinese game of Go, mm -hmm. and then and defeated the, it itself. defeated the best humans. The best ergo. humans, the champions, <laughs> obviously, and now it's the only champion of Go, and it's not only the champion, but it's also a system that proposed a new way of thinking about the game of Go. So it said, okay, you were playing this game for like 2,000 years or more. Uh, 
in a way that was okay, but I can show you how to play it better. Which the master, if I remember correctly, described as a beautiful game. Yes, a beautiful game, a non-human game mm -hmm. at the same time. So it's like a, a very important milestone because it has shown us that technology indeed, and uh, AI in particular, uh, can be a, a supplement to our cognitive systems. Uh, so it can be really something that uh, shows us things that we wouldn't be able to see without it. And uh, I think AlphaGo Zero, I, I don't really think it, I know it, is not going to be just used for playing Go, right? In the future, it's going to be deployed in medicine, probably, I would assume, also in uh, smart cities, you know, and collection of data from sensors everywhere, ubiquitous sensors. It will be used in education. It has a, a vast potential of usage in so many different spheres. So I think that this deep learning system that has exceeded human capacities of, of thinking about this particular game, this uh, specialized AI is something that uh, uh, was the biggest wow of the you know, of the decade. Within the industry that we're looking at today, um, let's look at um, where the opportunities are for people to, to maybe shift their careers somewhat, maybe look at um, uh, ways they can apply their existing skills, learn a few more things, and then you know, explode into life. Well, uh, we were talking about, um, you know, many different things here, including also uh, AlphaGo Zero, which is uh, a system that is supposed to help humans in solving certain tasks better. And I think that AI as a field uh, has a role to play in supplementing human work or augmenting it somehow or making it better. And I don't necessarily think that uh, artificial intelligence or generally high technologies are supposed to take away human jobs or human professions and the meaning of life. Uh, I think they're supposed to optimize something that wouldn't be possible without them, you know, at that level. Obviously, computers, machines have a higher computational power than humans, and uh, it's natural that they will be better at cer certain tasks. And, uh, you know, in medicine, you already see how um, a, a doctor could help expert systems, for instance, in diagnosing patients. And I think the same goes uh, for many other industries where uh, AI or machine learning can actually help in building better products and designing better services for other humans. So um, I know that the fear of AI is big, and I think this fear stems from the fact that we don't have a thorough debate about where we would like AI to go and where do we want to take it. And, and that many people just don't feel kind of uh, skilled enough or that they don't have enough expertise to actually discuss these topics. But I think it also will change in the future. Many pe more people will uh, understand where technology is going. We have digital natives uh, growing up with technologies, and I think that they will feel much more confident in these environments and they will be capable of such discussions. So uh, it is true that on one hand, technologies do take away some jobs, low-skilled jobs, but on the other hand, they can create jobs that we have never thought of. And, you know, uh, when it comes to buildings, uh, I uh, can think of one very good example of a profession of the future that is, uh, uh, you know, related to architecture. And on the other hand, it's related to artificial intelligence. And that's uh, space habitat engineer, for instance, right? And designers of space habitats in the future. Uh, if we take the exploration uh, of space seriously, then uh, this is definitely an option, right? Where technology steps in, uh, where um, artificial intelligence and various applications of uh, AI kind of step in to design habitats that are proper for the you know, future humans that will occupy these spaces in some way or another. So um, most definitely, uh, we can think of even more examples how, you know, um, current jobs can be supplemented by AI systems. And, uh, you know, through that, we can create uh, new products that we have not thought of before, and uh, that's definitely a, a, an optimistic vision. Well, we can continue like this for Ever. hours, for hours. Uh, this is a huge subject, and uh, uh, really, um, it fits in all around the other, the other uh, discussions that we're having today. Um, computing power, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, these are all things that will be coming really huge over the horizon in the coming year, two, three. And uh, um, I thank Alexandra for being with us today, albeit virtually.
Thank you so much for having me. And we'll see you again soon. Definitely. And uh, let's get on with the show.